Shall I start? Okay, ready? Ready. In this lecture, I'm going to um, explain what the Schur algebra is, um, how it uh, is used to study the polynomial representations of GLN, and uh, maybe how uh, its, its modules for the Schur algebra are related to representations of the symmetric group. The kind of representations that we want to study are uh, polynomial representations. Let's take K to be any infinite field. This hypothesis is uh, necessary to ensure that polynomials, that is formal polynomials in K, can be just thought of as polynomial functions. There is no difference between these two things if you have an infinite field. Then there is no restriction on the characteristic. Later we'll put some restrictions on the characteristic. Um, by a polynomial representation, I mean a representation in the usual sense. So that means it consists of a vector space V and uh, so this would be a finite dimensional vector space. But the field is now going to be this k. And rho is a homomorphism from GLN, GLMK to GLK. It's a representation of the group GLMK of invertible M by M matrices with entries in K on the vector space V and this K is the same as this K such that the function G goes to um, Z rho G V is a polynomial function of the entries of G for all V in V and Z in the dual vector space V prime. Okay, so this is a function of G. G is a matrix. It has M squared entries. This should just be a polynomial function of those m squared variables. That's the condition. If you take a basis of V, x1, x2, x, uh, some, x uh, something, and then you take the dual basis of V prime, then you write down the matrix of rho G with respect to that basis, then Zi, Vj, uh, Zi, rho G, Vj will be the ijth uh, or maybe jith. Uh, entry of the matrix corresponding to rho g with respect to that basis. So this condition is saying that with respect to any basis, um, the matrix entries of rho g are polynomial functions of g. It's the same as saying that. And that's that's the definition of a polynomial representation. Okay, some uh, basic properties of polynomial. Um, function uh, representations which I leave uh, I think I can safely leave as exercises to you first is that um, if you have a polynomial representation you can look at an invariant subspace of that representation that would also be a representation that's going to be a polynomial representation sorry what's your question yeah I'll come to that uh, this, uh, th so you ask for a few examples, these properties will help us to construct examples. Invariant subspaces of polynomial representations. Let's say examples. Direct sums of polynomial 
and tensor products of polynomial representations. So these are three ways of constructing new polynomial representations from old ones. So we need to start somewhere. And let me give you the simplest example, uh, the defining representation it's called. So Kn, Km, sorry. This is GLM, Kn is reserved for something else. It will be the N in Sn, the symmetric group on N letters. Km is a polynomial representation of GLM K. Why is that? As I pointed out earlier, being a polynomial representation means that the entries of the matrix are polynomials in, uh, sorry, you take uh, rho is a polynomial representation, the entries of the matrix of rho G are polynomial functions of the entries of G. But in this case, the um, KM is acting on, uh, GLMK is acting on KM, just, uh, you know, matrix, uh, you multiply it on the left of, say, a column vector. Then the matrix entries are the matrix entries, which are linear. The, so rho G is G itself, so its uh, matrix entries are the matrix entries of G. This is obviously a polynomial representation. And then you could do these things to it. And, try to construct um, lots of polynomial representations. OK, now let's come to Schur algebras. I'll be defining a family of algebras, S, K, M, N, eventually, which will be called Schur algebra. Yeah, one more thing I could add to this list is uh, maybe here and quotients by invariant subspaces. But we'll see a little later that this is not really needed because these will end up being the same as subspaces isomorphic to subspaces in, well, in most cases. You mean, you mean to say that the complement is also a polynomial? There will be a semi-simplicity result for many cases, but no, it's an important point that the semi-simplicity result doesn't always hold. So this, this will sometimes give new examples, but uh, uh, anyway, I was planning to focus mostly on the semi-simple case. So. Okay, so I'll construct these uh, algebras, um, which will serve somehow a purpose similar to the uh, purpose served by the group ring for a finite group, in the sense that modules for these algebras will correspond to polynomial representations of GLNC. I'll um, try to give a schematic statement here. So uh, I'll write rep. Uh, GLM. Then, if you like, you can think of this as the category of polynomial representations of GLM. And then we will have direct sum n equals 0 to infinity SKMN mod. You should think of this as the category of modules for the algebra SKMN. And then this direct sum would just mean that um, you would take uh, uh, direct sums of such modules, but we'll have some restriction that only finitely many of them can be uh, non-zero, and no morphisms between those pieces. And uh, what I'll be doing is uh, showing that there's some isomorphism of categories. But um, if you are not too fond of category theory, just ignore all this. But what I'm going to say is that, you know, representations of GLMK will break up like this over N. 
into uh, modules for Schur algebras. And these modules for Schur algebras will capture all the representation theory of GLMK. This enables us to replace um, this um, group with some nice uh, finite dimensional algebras over K. Okay, so that's the that's where we are headed, and um, that's just a rough statement. Let me define the Schur algebra first. I'll define some thing. Uh, which does not really depend on n as follows. Let a k m denote the polynomial algebra in m, m squared a variable. So polynomial algebra in m squared variables. So you should think of it as uh, polynomials on m by n matrices. And uh, SKM will denote the dual vector space AKM. So this prime today will denote dual vector space. And um, we'll take a inspiration from Schwartz's work on distributions and think of um, these linear functionals as distributions on the group G. This is just a notational device. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, so here's the notation for F in AKM and alpha in SKM. I can um, apply alpha, I can evaluate alpha at f and get an element of the field, right? This is just the dual space of this. But instead of writing it as alpha f, I will write it as integral over g f g d alpha g. And I'll call it the integral of f with respect to alpha. In quotes. There's really no measure here. It's not a measure theoretic integral. It's just a notation. But the value of this notation is that we should really think of elements of the Schur algebra as distributions on GLNC in some sense polynomial distributions on GLNC. And this uh, allows you, for example, to evaluate a function at a point, right? Um, you could look at... So this dual is not uh, graded dual, it's full dual. This, yeah. yeah, so the question is, is this dual in some way restricted? No, at the moment it's the full dual and that is going to that's a slide that's going to cause some problems later on so we'll have to be very careful this is an infinite dimensional vector space um, we're looking at all polynomials in m squared so this is an infinite dimensional vector space i'm just saying all linear functionals on that infinite dimensional vector space so it's a bit um, one has to be a bit careful there the double dual is not going to be uh, the dual of skm is not going to be akm This is just notation and we want to think of elements of this Schur algebra as distributions on the group. And so you could, for example, uh, define um, epsilon f, which I would also call integral f g d epsilon g to be um, f of the identity matrix. the m by m identity matrix. That's evaluation at the point. So this is a delta uh, function in Dirac sense at the identity. And that's a perfectly legitimate uh, element of the Schur algebra. Okay, I've been using the word Schur algebra, but so far I've only defined a vector space. 
let me tell you what the product is and the product is um, the convolution of distributions it's given by the following formula so I need to tell you how given um, alpha and beta in the Schur algebra um, how to evaluate alpha times beta on f right in other words I need to tell you how to evaluate this integral f of g d alpha beta g I need to give you a rule for this and the rule is a double integral f of x y d alpha x d beta y it's not even clear at first glance whether this makes any sense or not yeah g yeah so let me just uh, say that once and for all i'll uh, often be using g for glmk okay does this even make sense let's just think about it for a moment you can think of um, f of x y as a polynomial in y whose coefficients are polynomials in x y is m squared variables right and x is m squared variables but f of x y is a polynomial in um, 2 m squared variables okay and um, you can actually think of that as a polynomial in the m squared variables for y whose coefficients are polynomials in the m squared variables for x so if you so firstly we want to talk about this um, inner integral here and by that i just mean that you take that polynomial in y whose coefficients are polynomials in x and integrate those coefficients then you get a polynomial in y with constant coefficients because each of those coefficients will now give you an element of k and so then you can integrate that with respect to y so this makes sense okay and this is the formula for uh, products in the Schur algebra if you are familiar with functional analysis you won't find this or uh, too surprising this is called convolution or something okay and one needs to check then that this is associative um, and in fact epsilon is a multiplicative unit for this ring these are uh, fairly straightforward things I think I can leave them as exercises but it's worth worth doing these exercises okay so there you go starting with the poly, um, with the G well okay I've just defined um, the Schur algebra now let me tell you how given a polynomial representation of GLM you can get a module for the Schur algebra your question SKM is an associative algebra with unit. That's what it is. So, yeah. Ah, okay. So the question is, what is alpha f? Um, 
It's just a matter of unwinding definitions. F is a polynomial and SKM by definition is the vectors, dual vector space of the space of polynomials. So it's all linear functionals on that. So alpha of F is just evaluating the linear functional alpha on the polynomial F. Okay, so right now it's all very abstract. This, this integral means nothing. It, it just means this. So, uh, this this doesn't uh, I mean what Schwartz said that you should think of linear functionals as distributions he used uh, smooth functions or something and I'm just saying well let's use polynomials we just take the variables out of the linear functions because we have x into y we evaluate alpha of f as x times alpha to evaluate this double integral, you need to take uh, do it in two stages. And one thinking of the uh, thinking of this polynomial in the x and y variables as a polynomial in the y variables whose coefficients are in the x variables, integrating those coefficients, yes. and, then again, and then those coefficients become constants when you integrate out the variable, yes. and then you just get a polynomial in the y variables. You integrate that out again. Okay, let's come back to this. You start with a polynomial representation. And what I want to do is define a module for the Schur algebra. So I'll define um, rho tilde alpha. Alpha is in the Schur algebra. I want to define a module structure. So this will this should act on a vector v and I need to tell you what this is. In order to tell you what this is, it is enough to tell you what happens when I evaluate a linear functional on v at this value and now if you there's only really one way to put all this data together and get something meaningful out of it. Um, see, our hypothesis says that this is a polynomial in G. It makes sense to integrate it uh, with respect to alpha. I'll call this formula star. It's the main formula. This formula defines, um, so let me just say what the various things here are. Alpha is in SKM, V is in V, Z is in V prime. This formula defines for each alpha in the Schur algebra a vector rho tilde alpha V uh, in V, for every V in V, by telling you what the evaluation of any linear functional on that vector. And the right hand side makes sense because um, this is a polynomial function. This is where we are using the hypothesis that um, the representation is a polynomial representation. I claim that this um, turns V into an SKM module. Uh, to see that uh, this makes V an SKM module, we need to check the property that um, if I, well actually what I need to check is whether rho tilde alpha beta of V is equal to rho tilde alpha rho tilde beta of v right for all alpha beta and v but in order to do that I just need to check if this is for all z in v prime
right? So that's that's what I have to check. And once you write it like this, it puts us in a position to use this definition, and the proof is quite unsurprising. It just you just start off and keep going and with the left hand side and you end up on the right hand side. Well, maybe I'll start off at the right hand side just for fun. So the right hand side is integral over g, z, rho tilde alpha, rho tilde beta, v. Well, that um, let's just think of rho tilde beta v as a vector. And we have to apply this. So we'll apply this formula with uh, v replaced by rho tilde beta v. Oh, sorry, I mean to say, I just want to write this. This is the integral over g of z rho tilde g, uh, sorry, rho g rho tilde beta b. I think I'll write x here, d alpha x. That's the integral over g of, um, I'll bring this over here so it becomes rho prime x inverse z, the adjoint And now I can use my integral formula again and I get a double integral and uh, then I can bring this back. And then I'll use the fact that, sorry, this is not tilde, this is just rho. So when I bring it back, I get rho x, rho y. But since rho is a representation, I can write that as rho of x, y, v, d alpha x, d beta y. Now I'll use the product, uh, the formula for the product in the Schur algebra. So this is just integral over g, z, rho g, v, d, alpha, beta, g, which is the left hand side of this equation. Okay, no surprises here, you just do whatever, you start with one side and keep doing whatever you can till you get here. Okay, let's see if we can go the other way. Given a module for the Schur algebra, can we get a polynomial representation of GLN? Okay, one thing uh, I should have said while defining a polynomial, I think I said it, let me just remind you, V is a finite dimensional vector space. Now the question is, uh, given an SKB, SKM module, let's call it rho tilde V, can we recover rho? That means, can we find a polynomial representation rho? for which rho tilde is the associated module for the Schur algebra. And uh, to do that, we should be using this uh, formula, right? This is, this is what we want, rho tilde alpha v 
should be equal to integral g z rho g v dr. The same formula that I wrote earlier. So the thing is, we can figure out what rho g is if we can figure out what this polynomial is. This for each z and v, if we can figure out what this polynomial is, then we should be able to figure out what rho g is. Um, but maybe we can figure out what this polynomial is because we know for every alpha what uh, rho tilde alpha is. Okay, but then we um, so what we have is alpha goes to z rho tilde alpha v. This is um, from S k m to k. It's a linear functional on S k m. Now in the finite dimensional world we would have been fine. This linear functional would be again an element of a k m and that would be our polynomial 0 g v. But for an infinite dimensional vector space this double dual is never its dual. So they will always uh, you can end up with a linear functionals which do not correspond to any polynomials. Right? So that's the slight technical problem that we'll have to overcome. And the conclusion to draw from this is uh, that uh, we need to put some restrictions on the SKM module. And Schur's idea was to try to somehow break up this problem into finite dimensional pieces. Not every uh, SKM module would come from a polynomial representation. So, idea is this may not come from any F. So, this is the problem. And so the solution is break up things into finite dimensional pieces. The most natural way to do that is to take the polynomials AKM and write them as sums of their homogeneous components. A k m n. Let this be homogeneous polynomials of degree n. n could be any non-negative integer and I'll define S k m n to be the dual of A k m n. And I can identify this with uh, linear functionals in S k m which vanish on so this is a subspace of AKM, right? AKMN is a subspace of AKM. I'm just taking the degree n homogeneous part. And I look at if I just look at linear functionals on AKM which vanish on uh, AKMN prime for all n prime not equal to n, then that's the same as the linear functionals on a k m n. Okay. So in uh, using this, I can think of s k m n as a subalgebra of s k m, right? Well, at least as a subspace of s k m. Just SKMN are the linear functionals which vanish on polynomials of degree not 
homogeneous polynomials of degree different from n. So this is a uh, subspace of SKM and I claim that it is a subalgebra of SK. M. SKMN is a subalgebra of SKM. Why is that? Well, it's not, again, it's kind of a routine check. Um, I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you to check. Okay, so you, you can use this characterization that if two alpha and beta vanish on everything of degree not equal to n, then um, alpha times beta will also vanish on that. The main point is that uh, matrix multiplication. So when you write down the um, uh, product alpha beta, you'll be integrating f of x times y. And the point is that um, uh, f of uh, matrix multiplication is bilinear. So it somehow it won't change the degree when you integrate out one uh, one of the set of variables and leave the other. Okay, but so it's 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 not uh, completely obvious, but it's routine. You have to use the fact that multiplication is bilinear. Okay, and let's just. Uh, also defines a, a map from SKM to SKN. So for each alpha in SKM, we'll define alpha N in SKMN, which I'll think of as the degree N homogeneous part of alpha by um, saying that integral of I'll use the same integral notation for SKMN also. So integral of f of g d alpha n g. I must tell you what alpha n does to f. And f I can take to be any polynomial function because SKMN after all is sitting inside SKM should just be the integral of fng d alpha g, where fng is the degree n homogeneous part of f. this Dirac delta function epsilon in the Schur algebra which is just evaluation of the identity. You can apply this alpha goes to alpha into that thing and um, you get epsilon goes to epsilon n for each n. This is uh, this turns out to be the unit of SK. And um, th actually, more generally, this uh, alpha goes to alpha n is an algebra homomorphism. Alpha beta subscript n is alpha n times beta n. And this makes this the unit of SKMN. And um, the important point is that um, these are um, central. That means they commute with everything in SKMN. But you can also think of them as living in SKM. In that case, they are central idempotents in SKM. And you have that epsilon n, epsilon n prime is equal to 0 if n is not equal to n prime. So, um, this uh, n prime will kill everything whose homo which is not homogeneous of degree n prime. And if n is not n prime, then whatever is left will be killed by epsilon n. So the composition will be 0. 
Now whenever you have this, you can try to break up your space. So what you do is define given rho tilde v. Now this is my module for SKM. Let me define Vn to be rho tilde epsilon n. And I'll call this the degree n homogeneous part of V. And because uh, the epsilon n's are central, this Vn will be invariant. And uh, because of this property that epsilon n, epsilon n prime is 0 for n not equal to n prime, these Vn's will be um, uh, will be mutually disjoint. for n equals 0, 1 for all non-negative integers. So you kind of get these subspaces and we'll work with representations which break up like this. So we are already assuming that V is finite dimensional. Um, because we can't really expect in the polynomial representations of GLM we had started with a finite dimensional representation so on the Schur algebra side also we should start with finite dimensional representations we want any correspondence so uh, finite dimensional uh, finite dimensional that's assumed SKM module is said to be polynomial. Now this is a different notion of polynomial for Schur algebra modules. If V is the direct sum of n goes from 0 to infinity Vn. Of course if this is true then only finitely many of these things can be non-zero. Right? Because this is finite dimensional. There is a notion of polynomial for modules of the Schur algebra. There is a notion for, of um, polynomial for representations of GLN. And it is between these things that we will have a correspondence. In general, if, if, if V is not finite dimensional, you can't say anything about these V sub n's. If V is not even if uh, V is finite dimensional, this may not hold. No, no, I'm saying if V is, inf say, infinite dimensional, you can't say anything about the size if of V sub n. V is infinite dimensional, uh, with these things going on, um, you still cannot say anything about the size of n. It may be that V n is infinite dimensional too, um, in general. But it may be interesting to look at uh, what you get if you allow infinite dimensional Vs where all the Vns are finite dimensional. That should be quite manageable. And I think even the infinite dimensional case should be quite manageable by the Schur algebra methods. So long as this holds, but I haven't really tried to go much into that. I mean, the Schur algebras are uh, finite dimensional algebras. So uh, if you have any module for such an algebra to have a finite dimensional invariant subspace. So I think even the infinite dimensional case should be tractable provided in our case. But for simplicity I'm looking at Okay, so that's the so let's see how to go back. Right. Oh, but before we see how to go back, let us see that if you start with uh, uh, if you start with a polynomial representation of GLMK, you actually end up with a polynomial
let's put that down as a lemma f rho v is a polynomial representation of g l m k then rho tilde v is a polynomial s k m module and um, the proof is just a matter of breaking up so we know that the matrix coefficients of v are polynomials you can just break them up by degree okay so the homogeneous parts <laughs> but we need to do it in a sort of uniform way zv you look at this this goes to z rho gv this is a uh, from v cross v prime cross v to what v prime cross v to um, akm right the output is actually a function of g not just an element of k this is bilinear it's a bilinear function from v prime cross v to akm and since uh, v and v prime are finite dimensional this means that uh, you can bound uh, the degree of um, the image of this that is the image the degree of this will not exceed something you just take a basis here and a base maybe the dual basis there and look at the degrees of all the matrix coefficient the largest of that degree will be a upper bound for the degree for any matrix coefficient so all matrix coefficients will have degree bounded by something because of the finite dimensionality of these spaces so um, let's say um, let's say since v is finite dimensional um, the degree of z rho g v will be bounded for all z in v prime and v in v say by d so then you break this up into its um, okay so so now let's just maybe i'll use a new board for this this is the action of uh, alpha on v and by the uh, we want yeah so this is by definition given by this but then i can write this as a sum a finite sum because of the bound on the degree n goes from 0 to d of integral z rho g v d alpha n g right this will just pick out the degree n homogeneous part of this and since this is a sum of its homogeneous parts this will add up to this and so that is z rho tilde alpha n this thing is in vn because epsilon you can think of this as rho tilde epsilon n alpha n so then this is uh, rho tilde epsilon n rho tilde alpha n v so it's in um, uh, and the definition of vn is rho tilde epsilon n of v so that's that's uh, that's in vn and so this is saying that um, uh, at least when um, evaluated against z every vector is a sum of its uh, 
components from the different VNs. But that's true for every linear functional Z. So that means that you have this. So, so you get, if you start with a polynomial representation of GLMK, you end up with a polynomial representation of the Schur algebra in the sense that I said. And now we'll just see that um, we can recover the original polynomial representation of GLMK from the polynomial representation from a polynomial represent. Okay, from a polynomial representation of the Schur algebra, we want to construct a polynomial representation of GLMK, and we would like to see that these two constructions are mutual inverses. And basically, we, we were trying to do this earlier and we got stuck because of some infinite dimensionality thing. But now that will go through because we'll do it degree by degree. And we have finite dimensional spaces in each degree. So f rho tilde v is a polynomial representation of SKM then there exists a polynomial representation of GLRM K to which it is associated by the equation star that I had written down earlier. I had defined for each polynomial representation of GLMK a uh, module for the Schur algebra. And how do you do that? Well, um, you consider um, the linear functional phi ZV, which takes alpha n to um, z rho tilde alpha n v. So this is from um, s k m n to k. This is the dual of a k m n. a k m n is just a finite dimensional vector space. So this corresponds to some function fg in akmn because the double dual of a finite dimensional vector space is the original vector space. And then I will define rho g by using the formula. Well, I must have for this star to hold that fg should be a matrix coefficient of rho g. So this allows me to define rho g for each g. Now I need to check that rho is actually a representation. That means rho of x, y should be rho of x composed with rho of y. And that again is one of those proofs that just uh, goes through. You need to just find the right way to get started. Um, I'll, so I'll do that quickly. What do I want to do? I want to verify that rho, which I just defined, by figuring out what polynomial that linear functional corresponded to is actually uh, well defined. So to see that, that is actually multiplicative. So I want to know if rho x, y is equal to rho x, rho y, which is the same as asking if this identity holds for all Z and V. Okay. 
Okay, but let's just start off here. This is by definition um, double integral. No, um, let's not do that. So the double integral of this, yes? In the definition of rho, we have this fg. And, and uh, so fg is by definition. This? Uh, here we have phi is yeah. iv. Yeah, phi is iv. And that's a linear function on a finite dimensional. So yeah. it comes from an element of a k m n. So you get fg, right? Yeah, so I use and this linear functional on a yes. SKMN to get a polyno homogeneous polynomial of degree n, that is FG. which I call Fg. And, that, and you define, this is a defining uh, equation for rho, right? So once I've got Fg for each g, and of course z and v, this allows me to define the defining equation for rho. Yeah, rho g. Okay. So rho g is just defined by this. And so here when you're using your, you have to use You'll have to check, of course, that this thing is bilinear. Um, you know, z comma v goes to f g is bilinear in z and v, and all that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it it definitely defines it. And now I want to check if rho is uh, homomorphism from G L M to the. Yeah. So let's just integrate. with respect to any two uh, any two elements of the Shura algebra alpha and beta and this becomes well the inner integral gives me z rho g v uh, sorry rho um, yeah by definition of the product of alpha beta, this is d alpha beta g. But then this is z rho tilde alpha beta v. But since uh, I started with a module for the Schur algebra, I can break this up. This is z rho tilde alpha rho tilde beta v and now I can re-expand this as a double integral z rho x rho y v d alpha x d beta y. So what have I got? I've got that no matter what alpha and beta I take in the Schur algebra, integrating out this or this gives the same answer. Okay, integrating out two times. But that must mean that these are the same polynomials in the 2m squared variables x and y. So that uh, shows that uh, rho is a representation. So what we've shown in effect is that the polynomial representations for the Schur algebra correspond to polynomial representations for GLM and moreover the polynomial representations for the Schur algebra SKM can be um, uh, each of they, they have decompositions into modules for the SKMNs. So if you want to understand the representation theory of um, GLM, the polynomial representation theory of GLM, you need to understand the uh, modules for each of the algebras SKMN. Okay, and um, maybe the last thing I'll do is so far this Schur algebras SKM and they seem pretty abstract. I mean, how do you uh, get a grip on them? So I'll take five minutes. Is that okay, or you have to leave? No, okay. So I'll take five minutes more, or maybe it may even go a little longer to explain um, how uh, we can get a little grip on these things, and they'll turn out to be very concrete objects. Of course, how do we start getting a grip on these things? Well, this is not such a bad thing. It's just polynomials in m squared variables. So let's try to write down a basis for this. 
And what is this? These are the homogeneous polynomials of degree n in m squared variables. And uh, so this is spanned by monomials, homogeneous monomials, I mean monomials of degree n. And I'll use a notation which is i underscore j underscore to denote x i1 j1 x i2 j2. So each of these is a, the i j i k you know this is the i1 j1 entry of the matrix x x i uh, my degree is n so I should have n of these. Where, oh sorry, here there should be no underscores, these are just, uh, where i underscore is the vector i1 i n, j underscore is j1 j n. Of course these variables commute, so this is not, uh, you know, different i and j's could give the same monomial. But to what extent? Um, so I'll say that um, so the symmetric. Let's let's just give things a name. So I'll define. I'll denote by I M N the set of all possible I's and J's. I mean individually. So this is just each index. Each of these things should be between one and M, and there are N of them. So I'll take the set one to M and take its n-fold Cartesian power and let's call that I um, M N and this has an action of the symmetric group S N it just by uh, permuting the n different uh, components of this Cartesian power so W say W in the symmetric group will act on I1 i n by taking it to i w 1 i w n. That's the action. And the question is when do two uh, x i j and say x k l, when do they give the same monomial and the answer is quite obvious. It is, so if you're going to permute these variables, you would better do the same permutation to the i's as you would do to the j's. So the answer is that if you can take the, yeah, so um, if you can simultaneously permute one set of indices to the other, to so say that i, j, I'll say have the same relative position as KL if there exists W in SN such that WI is equal to K and WJ is equal to N. So the same W must take this to this and this to this. That's when we say that they have the same relative position. And the observation is that x i j is equal to x k l if and only if i and j have the same relative position as k and l. So the uh, Vector space AKMN has a basis given by um, multi indices, pairs of multi indices up to uh, this equivalence relation of having the same relative position. And uh, if you've been following my lectures on symmetric group representations, you'll immediately recognize the significance of this, uh, which is uh, the following fact. Suppose you know, this is in the context of permutation representations. If you have a finite set on which a group acts, say uh, the group acts on a set X, then you can make the, I'll, I'll look at KX, 
the space of all k valued functions on x that becomes a representation of the group G by rho x g f of x is f of g inverse dot x, right? And um, given a function um, k from x cross x to the field k, you can define an integral operator tkf um, from kx to kx by integrating with respect to this kernel k. So tkf of x is summation over y in x k x y f of y. This gives you all linear operators from kx to kx and the ones which give uh, endomorphisms of this representation are precisely the ones which are invariant of the relative position of the pair x comma y. So let me just write that down formally. G K X is just T K where K are those kernels for which K G X G Y equals K X Y for all X Y in X and G in G. In the context of Schur algebras, what this buys us is that we've got Sn acting on Imn, n tuples of elements from 1 to m, and uh, this turns k Imn into a representation of Sn. And the Schur algebra SK MN is the endomorphism algebra of this representation. I haven't quite shown this. I've just said that it has a basis which looks right. One needs to compute the product. But I just want to give you a sense of where we are going. So this is what we'll find. And what this will mean is that if this representation is semi-simple, then this representation, this endomorphism, the endomorphism algebra of any semi-simple representation is a sum of matrix algebras. And uh, well, actually, the split semi-simple will be a sum of matrix algebras over k, and therefore will be a split semi-simple algebra itself. Not only that, the simple um, so this immediately will give us uh, the corollary that SKMN is a semi-simple algebra. Not only uh, if if this if this representation is semi-simple. So for example, if you assume that the characteristic of K is greater than N, then this will be semi-simple, and um, this will also be semi-simple. And moreover, it will follow that the simple modules for this will be in bijective correspondence with the simple irreducible constituents of this representation of the symmetric group. So this will also give us a relationship between the representation theory of Sn and polynomial representations of GLN. For each degree n, in fact, what you'll get is that the mod simple modules for SKMN will be in bijective correspondence with the irreducible representations of the symmetric group which correspond to partitions uh, of n with no more than m uh, parts. Okay, but I'll just stop here now because that will take a little time and I would like to do it carefully sometime in the future. <laughs>